So what happens when your sample get, comes here at Delta? We, you know, we take the envelope or the container or whatever, it has a tattoo number on it and that's usually what we look at and we compare it with what order that comes from the association. Um, and I think with the Angus now, I'm not sure if the, the, the request would come directly through from um, you guys. So um, we'll match that sample up and say, okay, this is the test that needs to be done. Then once that's ready, we put it in our biobank. So we, we, we store every sample that comes in. And then after that, our scientists will go in, pick out the sample, run it through DNA extraction. So extracting the, DNA, the, the biological material out of the, the sample, and then um, putting it onto SNP genotyping, which is really a translation of that biological material into data points on the computer. Um, after that, we do data analysis, which is just analyzing the data we have and then reporting the results back to you depending on what kind of tests you ask for. And for SNP parentage, um, you know, the, the turnaround time generally if it's just SNP parentage, the turnaround time should be under 10 business days. And if you have other tests, it may take up to 25 days depending on what it is. All right, so SNP, um, I think Kajal's you know, mentioned it in passing here and there. I just wanted to make sure everybody understands what it really is. It's single nucleotide polymorphism. It's a mouthful even for me to say. And what it really is, is just single letter variations in our DNA that tells us how, like, that, that defines the difference between us individuals. And essentially, all of us have pretty much the same genomic makeup. The only difference are that there are specific sites that m are different and that makes us who we are. Um, and so I want to give you an example here. Um, these are three bulls. They have pretty much the same um, sequence, as you can see. The only difference is that that one site, that square there that I've um, kind of rounded off, notice that the green and the purple one has G and the blue one has T. That is, that, that is a SNP. And usually SNPs are dual in their nature. So they can be either A or T or T or G or you know, whatnot because DNA is made of A, C's, T's and G's. And so what I will be using instead of you know, making it confusing, I'm gonna be denoting them as type A or type B because there's usually only two types in one particular SNP marker. Okay, what is parentage? Um, with that genetic variation that we have in SNPs, we compare two individuals and determine if they are a parent and offspring relationship based on genetic inheritance. Um, ISEG is an international body that um, dictates some of these guidelines and they have identified 120 core SNP markers that are good for SNP um, parentage verification. And ISEG also st states that um, you need to have at least 95 SNP comparisons common between your um, individual A and individual, like the one and two individuals, to determine whether or not they are, you know, offspring and and, um, and parent, and determine if it's 95%? no 95 markers, so 95 comparisons. Yes. So 95 out of those 120. 95 100, 120. So you don't have to have all 120. You just need to have 95 of those 120 to make a good comparison. And realistically, we're talking about as many comparisons as impossible. Um, I will talk about some of the challenges we have as to why we can't always have 95 mar um, comparisons, but we'll, we'll, go, we'll get into it. So, mm -hmm. so when we used to use blood typing and then the next step and then this step. Could you give us a number of how much more accurate you are now compared to the old stuff thing? Um, so blood typing is, is, it's just like one data point compared to another. Um, microsatellite, which is the next step onto it, generally I think we're looking at 10 to 20 markers and then SNP we're looking at 95. So I will talk about like how that number really does matter because the more information you have, the more confident your results are. Well, and that's a nice number to, to tell people that we're... Yep, yep, exactly. Yeah. And realistically, I mean, I, I don't know if Kajal agrees with me, but I, I think that the more, more, than, more than 95 is, is what I, I, I would like to eventually aim to be because accuracy really just goes up, you know, after that. And, I'll, 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 bring, I'll bring us into that later. Okay, so for the people who you know, um, aren't super sure about genetic inheritance, it's essentially 
One copy come from mom and one copy come from dad. Um, Kajal said just now that, you know, the expectations usually 50% of you comes from mom and 50% of you comes from dad. But I mean, in reality, there are some, you know, genetic biological um, processes that doesn't necessarily adhere, adhere to that process. But for this case, for, for, for parentage analysis, what we really care about is just this. That that guideline, that rules that we're adhering with is one copy come from mom and one copy comes from dad. So um, I want to uh, get into this. I, I don't want to sound like a, a, a high school teacher, but I'm going to go, go into the, the little details in case this is not something that you guys are super familiar with. Um, so at every, I mentioned that every marker you'd be making a comparison, right? And so I want to show you some, um, some examples of what's considered a match and what's considered a mismatch. So here, uh, this one here, the calf is a BB, the sire is an AB. The calf only has Bs, right? And the sire has a B, so that's a match, okay? Second one here, the calf is an AB, the sire is a BB, and the sire can only give out Bs, right? And so that is a match as well, all right? So it's pretty, pretty straightforward. So as long as there is one of it that's in the sire, then you're, you're good. Now this is a case where that marker would be considered a mismatch. Reason being is that, you know, um, the sire is BB. It, there's no way that it would be able to give it to the calf that's AA, right? So that's a straight up mismatch. And I talked about common SNP markers and how they have to both have information that is not a comparison at all, because there is no information in this sire. So this is the, this is the basics. Okay, I don't want you guys to squint and look at this slide. This is basically what information we're dealing with. This is 102 SNP markers um, between a calf and a sire. Our computer looks at every single one of those markers, determine whether or not they are common, that, that whether they, they both have information, and make the decision of whether they're a match or a mismatch. Then um, the computer would say, okay, this is the number of markers that match. So what really defines qualification and disqualification is that when you make a comparison, every single one of those marker comparisons that you make has to match, and that is considered a qualification. Um, there is a little bit of wiggle room in there, and um, the maximum number of mismatch we can have out of 95 comparisons is uh, two. And that actually translates to 97%. And so we've kind of uh, put in a, you know, a, a, a threshold saying that 97% match is, a, is, is qualification, but 99 to 100% is what I consider a very solid qualification. Okay? And on the flip side, under 97% match, that's disqualification. Okay, I want to shift focus a little bit. Um, onto uh, you know, the difference between sire verification and parent verification. So sire verification is very straightforward. You take two things and you say, are they, uh, are they uh, um, you know, offspring and parent relationships? So are they sire and calf relationship? You're just looking at those two things and those two things only. However, when you're doing parent verification, you're looking at the bigger picture. You're looking at all three of those relationships together with each other. Um, now, it's not about looking at the sire and the calf by itself, and then sire and the dam by itself. It's actually using this, um, this technique called dam anchoring. And dam anchoring is essentially taking the calf's profile, comparing it to the dam, and see whether or not they are a full qualify, like a, a solid qualification um, based on, on, on their markers. And if it's a solid qualification, then it clumps those two units together and then take the sire and compare it as a third thing to determine whether or not the sire qualifies. So why, um, what it really does is that um, it, it makes it in such a way that the parentage is a little bit more stringent to the sire. And why we do that is because it's really easier to tell who the dam is of calf. Um, and if you find that a dam, if we find that a dam doesn't qualify, um, then the dam anchoring doesn't occur. So if that doesn't work, like if it's under 97, uh, it's under 99% actually, then we would say, okay, we're just gonna compare the calf and the sire as it is a, a, as a pair, like sire verification. Does that make sense? 
Do you say easier, easier for you, or easier because it's less likely that we made a mistake? Um, how do I say that? Like, I think generally because the, the, when, when the baby is born, you know, the dam is there. And therefore, um, for some, some producers, they, they record that. And, and so, it, and also like with the sire, I think like we, we're not 100% sure sometimes where, you know, who, 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 who gets to, to the dam. And therefore, that's why it's easier in, in, in that sense, I think. In a practical fashion. In a practical fashion. Not scientifically. Not scientifically. Sorry, <laughs> oh, I didn't get that. Sorry. Thanks, Kirk. <laughs> okay, so I mentioned how um, dam anchoring, you know, is actually a really, really good tool to use because you are now, um, you know, allowing yourself this ability to discern between very closely related um, bulls if they're sire, if they're sires of your calf. Uh, so in the multi-sire pasture, um, dam anchoring actually has a, a, is really great to use because if you, you have like full um, siblings on the farm as, as bulls, you, you can actually tell them apart quite easily if they're a calf. Now I want to go through a little bit about um, how parent, like a dam anchor would really cause differences in, in sire verification versus parent verification. Um, on the left panel here, this is a bunch of calf sire pairs. Um, and then I'm going to throw in the dam, and they're going to be the exact example on the right here. And I want to let you see what kind of differences it actually makes. So calf and sire pair number one, AB and AB, well, they're exactly the same genotype, so obviously it's a match. Now let's throw in the dam. The dam is an AA. and the calf is an AB. So the, calf, the dam can only give out A's, right? And therefore, the, the A has now been taken care of. There is, it's been accounted for. So the B and the calf had to come from the sire. And therefore, the sire is an AB. And that is, let's match. Let's go to the next example. Um, calf is AB, sire is BB. Well, that's obviously a match as well. You throw in the dam. Remember dam anchoring, we always look at the dam first, right? So the dam is a BB. The calf is an AB. So the, the calf would have the B's, its B taken care, advantage, uh, sorry, taken uh, account for because the dam, has give, like, the dam has only ability to give out B's, right? And so the calf has A has to come from the sire. Fortunately, if you look at the sire, it's BB. So, so, so not match. The calf would have ended up being uh, AA, which possibly could have been. Sorry? Instead of AB. Yeah, it could so be AB A A now. If either <coughs> if either of them not be an AA because it looks like you could have got A from the sire and the other B from the dam, would that not be much? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. The, if no, the cap was an A, if it if it, if it can. Say first, the top can say first. The oh, the top, the top one. one. That's right. It would have been it, the top one if it was an AA. The calf was an AA. Yeah. With the dam and sire, it would still have been a match. Yeah. All right. So final one. Um, it's a calf. Um, a, the calf is AB. Sire is AA. Match. Throw the dam in is exactly the same one as the top one, really, um, because the A had to come from the dam now. But then there's B. Hmm. It's not. It's not the sire. Yeah. So this is how this. You know how it could change your your your. Parent, your parent verification here. And so with this higher stringency um, of parentage, you may see a very small percentage of your parents um, with poor quality genotypes. And I want to talk about what that means um, in a second. Uh, that your calf was originally qual could have co originally qualified the sire, but now changed because the dam was anchored. OK, so on that note, I'm going to move towards challenges and what you know what we have to work with and how we can overcome them collectively so from your perspective there is two overarching questions that i usually get from the association the first one is why did the calf and dam disqualify and the other one is why did why are my parentage results delayed i'm going to touch on that you know uh, closer to the end of the presentation but i want to focus on the first question um, the most, and I think that's the one that um, Kajal mentioned that you guys are very concerned about. So there's two reasons for disqualification. 
The first one is, is not the daddy. <laughs> that, that's, uh, it's not the daddy and not the mommy. 95% of our disqualifications that we return to the association is because legitimately the bull that was listed or the cow that was listed isn't actually the parent of the calf. I did some um, statistics before I came out here and I uh, looked at the 6,000 samples that we've worked at, um, worked with, and out of those 6,000 some samples, we find that most of them qualified. So 383 disqualifications were the ones we reported back to the association. 95% of those 383 um, belonged to the category where it was just not the right um, bull and the right, or, or, or the right cow. Um, there is a very small percentage of them where poor genotech quality and quantity might have been a factor. And so how, I wanted to talk about what that actually means. So SNP quantity is essentially how many SNP markers there are in your profile. Um, at Delta, for every sample that comes through that we test, we make sure that it has at least 95 SNPs. Because of that guidelines that, that I, I've spoken about, we want to make sure that that quality is good and has uh, the right amount number of SNPs for us to make a comparison of. Um, if you have less than 95 SNPs, we fail it and we redo the testing from the beginning again. So we want to give it an, a second try. Um, our technology has really come a really long way. Um, we have been, um, you know, our, our tests are a lot more robust, results are a lot cleaner, and so all these newer genotypes is, is actually really, it's not hard to get 95 SNPs, but with older genotypes, especially if they're like five to 10 years older, um, they are, um, the quality may not be great, as well as the fact that they have, they might have much fewer number of SNPs. And with, oh, sorry, go ahead. So when you say five years or older, are you talking samples that get sent in five years later, or are you talking genotypes that were done five years ago? Genotypes that were done five years ago. So an old sample that come in, like let's say if they're 10 years old, actually the stuff that we have in our inventory that was like, you know, from 10 years ago, when we test them today, it's still just exactly as good as what they are, like as our new, new samples. And so with that, You'll notice uh, with, with those older genotypes, because there are fewer SNP markers, um, each marker carries more weight. Um, here is a little example about how that, wh why that is. Um, if you have two mismatches, and this is two different cases, two mismatches across the board, one of them with 100 comparisons and the other one with 60. The one with 100 comparisons is 98%, and so it makes it a qualification. The other one, it's two mismatches, same number, but 60 comparisons. That makes it 96%, which drops below that threshold of what we consider a qualification. Oh, and so, sorry, with that, um, the more comparisons we have, the more confidence we have in our parentage, and therefore the more room for error. And so when I say like 95 SNP markers is the minimum, if you have more, the more confident you are in, in, in that analysis. All right, let's move on to quality. So what does it mean by SNP quality? Quality is how confident we are that each of those markers are actually what they say they are. Um, this is the graph that we see when we do our analysis. This is actually a raw result that we get. Um, in this picture, you can see the clouds, the, the, the purple clouds, the, sorry, the, not the purple, the, the orange one and the green and the blue. Each of those dots that you see are actually one sample in that particular marker. And in this case, I'm really confident that every single sample that's on this graph is, exa is exactly what it's supposed to be. So this dot here, I know that it's a BB for sure. So this is, this is something that I'm very confident in when I look at it. Now, when does it become not confident? When does it come, become iffy? Do you see that red dot in the middle of clouds? That red dot is neither here or there. It's not in the AA group, it's not in the AB group. Like, what is it actually? At Delta, what we do is that we actually discard that point entirely. Because bad information is better, uh, sorry, no information is better than bad information. That will actually skew your parentage results going forward. And, you know, like, if you don't include it, then it just never becomes a comparison and just <coughs> never, never makes a difference in your parentage. And so you may ask me, what is the reason for this? 
Sample quality, unfortunately, is actually the biggest reason for poor SNP quality or SNP quantity. When you have a good sample, it will call 120 times out of 120 SNPs. It's, it, and they're all very, very clear, and they are, they're all of great quality genotypes. However, when you have a sample that's not so great, um, you'll, en you'll end up having lots of that, as well as just the number of calls are, are a lot less. And so um, with the older genotypes, um, what uh, Collagen and I have been working on is getting all the stuff that we have before, looking at how many SNPs they have, and then basically saying, let's find these samples and then let's upgrade them to get them to that 95 SNP levels, because not all of them have 95 SNPs or, or higher. Um, and then on, like, on the kind of rolling basis, if we see a parentage <coughs> come up with potentially a sire or a dam that has poorer, older genotypes, we would go and try to get a sample of it and retest it and upgrade it as, as we can. And you're pulling back in the old inventory. Files to find it and try to retest. Yeah, so we have all the transfers from um, the old lab there, and so we would be, as long as they are in our inventory, we can pull them and, and test them again. Yeah, and I mean... Extreme situation, you might have to get a straw semen or something like that. Yes, I mean, like, we understand the straws of semen could be very expensive, so we would try, that's be our last case scenario. Uh, and usually what we'll do is, do we have an, something in our inventory? And we're like, okay, yes, we do, let's do this. If the stuff in the inventory is to par or is just straight up not there, then we'll ask Kajal, does the producer have a sample? Because that would really, really help. And that's when we ask um, for potentially you guys. Yes? So what kind of things affect sample quality? What makes a good sample work? Oh. Perfect, you actually just, you're gonna segue me into my next slide. These are good samples. Um, actually, 70% of our samples are hair, and so I generally say um, hair has to, be, has to come from the tail switch of the animal. They should be coarse, and when you look at the sample, in, like the roots should be like nice big hooks. And what our, that's what our technicians love to say about them is that they're juicy, juicy DNA samples. <laughs> That's what they love to say. They're like, look at this, this is the, the juiciest sample I've ever seen. Um, that, is, that is what we consider a good sample. And um, the thing is that when you're sampling your calves when they're so young, um, it could be challenging, and therefore there are tag options out there for you to, to, to do that. Um, I think the CAA sells Allflex tags. Yeah. And so they're, they're actually a really good option to use. They also, um, the Allflex tags are now altered in such a way that it's not a one-shot deal anymore. You can we can actually um, store the tissue and keep just using the liquid part of it. So it's actually really, really nice that way so that you know, there's a long-term storage option inbuilt yeah. in that. Do you have an age break when it's better to use this tissue <coughs> versus the hair then? Nope. They're, they all, they're all basically the same to us. Yeah. Right, but you just said that. Oh, you mean like, oh, sorry, in, as a, yeah, in the calf? Yeah. Uh, I think it's really a discretion thing. Like if you notice that the, when you pull, when you look at the tail hair and the follicles are very fine and you can't really see them, if you have difficulty seeing them, chances are it's probably going to be a little bit hard for us to get DNA out of them. But if you're desperate, really, if you, if you really, really, you know, are desperate, <coughs> um, send more of it. Like, if the, if the hair is really fine, send more of it. Then we have a better shot at getting it to work. Yeah. yeah. I find that if I use, as soon as that calf tail hair looks coarse visually from a distance, mm -hmm. you're good. Whereas that really fine baby calf, yeah. you can't even pull it. Yeah. And I mean, like, especially, like, hair from, like, the, the, the head and stuff, they're not, not great either. Because, like, they don't really have nice follicles at all. So. We maintain um, the original sample if we can. So let's say if we have enough hair, we will use a little bit of it, and then we would keep the rest. If we had not enough, then we would extract the DNA and store it in our minus 80 freezers. What would be the most efficient format for you to have it in to store over the long term? Hair. Because it's an ambient temperature, uh, it doesn't cost very much for us to store. While a lot of these, like semen and um, blood, they need to be stored in minus like 20, minus 80 environments, and therefore we actually have to maintain um, freezers and freezers and freezers to, to keep them. So preferably not, but if that is all that is there is, then... I think at point, some point in time I've mailed semen. Yes. And to be analyzed. So is, is, there, is there a window 
Or oh, no. When you say it doesn't store well, like to keep it frozen, I've sent it to you in, en in an envelope. So the semen, if you send it to us, and then we, what we do is that we put it into uh, tubes and stick it in the freezer for long term. But the semen doesn't have to be active. It just has to have the biological material, right? So we extract the semen and we store the semen away. But then because it's a straw, you cut it, you can't really cap it back. So we actually have to put it in tubes and store them that way. And also the other thing is that older, oh, that's really coming down right now. <laughs> um, the semen, when we store it long enough, um, it actually starts to go bad. It starts to smell bad. <laughs> I've actually worked on some really old semen before, and when I first started at Delta, that I think that's how they haze me into, into the company. <laughs> They're like, yeah, do all this stuff, and then, oh man, some of them were quite, quite stinky because we were look, working, at, like, working with like, some really, really old bulls at the time. So. so as far as storage goes, if we said you have 60 or 80 hair versus 30 hair. Oh, actually, that's a great question. Um, 40 to 50 is what we recommend, but don't count it, really. Like, don't go there and count the hair. I say pinky size amount is good. If you have the ability to s grab two of those, put it in the same envelope. If we had to go back and, and, and retest, we don't actually have to call Kajal or Avery and say, oh, please, can you get them to send another sample? Then it takes time, right? So get, get more sample to us. And Sometimes we receive samples that are so big, like so much, and we're like, oh, is there any of the animal left? <laughs> <laughs> so this is some examples of bad sample quality. You've seen the, the fuzzy hairs. And actually, that's not necessarily the biggest problem with that hair. It's actually the fact that there is no follicles on that one. So fuzzier hair, less DNA, you know, le less ability for us to get DNA out of it. And, and this one is just the fact that the follicles has been like night trimmed off, so no no actual DNA can be extracted from the ends of the hair. This one is actually a little bit of a mess. When we receive it, it was a whirl pack. Um, the semen straw busted on transit, and everything leaked everywhere. I felt bad for the the postman that 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 dropped the, the envelope off because it was just it was damp. The envelope was damp. <laughs> So what I, we recommend is that if you ever want to send a semen sample and you're afraid of it being crushed, take one of these pens or a, cheap, a cheaper, like 50 cent yeah, pen. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, take off the, the ink and then stick the semen in there and mail it into, in whatever envelope you want. It, it provides a really nice crush proof and, um, you know, con container. Because I've seen um, Canada Post like roll over our, our envelopes before with tire marks and everything. So, yeah. This one's an interesting one. I've actually, this is, the, this is probably the one time I've seen this. That looks like a really good hair sample, isn't it? Problem is, that's a photocopy of a sample. Yeah. When, we, when, we, when we received it, we were like, what, where, where is this? I can't pick it out. What is, it tripped us out so hard. But yeah, so um, the party actually just keep records of every sample that they send, so they photocopy everything. And that was what we got instead of the actual sample. Could you possibly get a, a DNA sample on that? No. <laughs> you, that you that person who handled that baby. No, yeah, it'd be a tree. Actually, I don't even know if there's much of a DNA of the tree left <laughs> in that paper. Yeah. yeah. And that little fuzzy bit you got there is just somebody trimmed it off, right? Yeah, they really trimmed it off. And I mean, in, in the first place, that is also a hard, if it had follicles, it would be a difficult sample to, to deal with anyways because of the fact that there's not a lot of biological material. But I mean, we appreciate that sometimes you don't really have a choice, um, especially if the animal lost its tail or something, um, you know. So if you have uh, samples that are like fuzzier, just send us more of it and then we can, you know, hopefully get something out of it. Okay, so I want to bring you back to, you know, um, what affects our parentage again. Um, this is your family portrait here, sire, dam, calf. If you had something happen to the sire, something happened to the dam, or something that happened to the calf, so their genotypes aren't good, it actually affects the entire picture. So it's like your family portrait. If somebody, you know, jump out of picture or just like is blurred out, it really changes, you know, the quality of the picture in general. It's the same thing. You, we want to make sure that each of those components are good so that the parent verification is actually very good as well.
so I want to summarize here. These are the few challenges that um, you know, SNP parentage faces. Um, SNP quantity, SNP quality, poor quality sample that affects the first two, and an increased stringency of parentage with dam anchoring. So other than the fact that sample quality could cause some delays um, in parentage verification, these are the other things that could affect. Um, one of the main ones is when a sample arrives at Delta, we, we make that comparison with the orders we have. If we don't have an order, um, we don't really know what to do with it. And also sometimes it really brings to the question about whether it came from the Angus Association members. It could be from Hereford, it could be from Simmental, and we don't know that. And so um, make sure that before you, you know, send in a sample, make sure you go to the Angus Now uh, or whatever platform that you're use, still using and trans transitioning into and make that order for us first. Um, misidentification of animals are uh, also something that could cause delays. Um, if a sample was misidentified as, as a certain thing, then you know, like it would cause confusion as to why is it not qualifying to the sire or qualifying to the dam. The other one is a multi-sire pasture situation where you have multi-sires qualifying. Um, and usually that dam anchoring really, really helps solve this, this one. So it's, it's great. Now, the, 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 this one is rare. I have seen it a couple times. And microsat microsatellite, which is our old technology, um, don't match SNP results. And what we usually do is that we go back through the uh, you know, individual components and find out what the actual issue is. And we found, I think the latest case was that there was just a misidentified sample somewhere in there that really caused the problem. Um, twins, twin births. So when you have two animals with the same genotype, the first question Delta would ask is that, hey, Kajal, hey, Avery, are these twins? Because that's the identical twins. They have to be identical twins for the genotypes to be exactly the same. And so um, if the answer is no, then what we would do is that we, Delta would go back and redo the tests again to make sure it's not something that we've made a mistake on. Um, if um, it is twins, then you guys will get your results just right away. So, and uh, the last one, I'm not sure if it's actually of a concern to you guys, but like if you have sire or dam genotype that's not on file, then your parentage verification obviously won't go through because there isn't anything to compare it with. So if you ever have questions about whether or not the animal has it, its sire or its dam has been tested before, I think the association would be able to help you out with it and tell you whether or not it's available. It's on the website. Yeah. Identical twins will always have the same. Exactly. Oh. That embryo split. Same. Yes. So yeah, but like Very siblings good. are yeah. not. They're f fraternal twins yeah. are, yeah. they're like siblings. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we've gone through quite a few of those points already. Good quality sample, good amount of sample, um, getting orders through from the CAA. Um, label your samples with um, clear, unique identifications. If you happen to have animals that are exactly the same ID for some reason on your farm, make sure that when you send it in, let us know that they're unique samples. These two are different from each other and, and what is different about them. Um, if you have uh, two samples that you are sending it into us just because you want us to store it, that's great, but let us know that they're exactly the same sample so that we don't test it twice accidentally. Um, if the calf is exposed to multiple sires, provide all the sire and dam information. It actually doesn't cost us any more or, or, or cost you guys any more to include all the sires that's necessary in there. We can test 10, 20, even you know, 50 sires, as many as you want um, for, for, you know, for us to report the results to you.